blessed. And as we look at the Word of God, think about what He says, call these servants. You know, those who study the Gospels and compare them, they tell us that Matthew's Gospel, the first of the four, it portrays Jesus as king. There's much said there, particularly to a Jewish audience, about Jesus being king of the Jews and Jesus being king of all, descended from King David. Luke's gospel, skipping over Mark momentarily, the gospel in which I'm preaching, Luke's gospel portrays the humanity of Jesus the Son of Man. And we see Him in all of His humanness and His human relationships. And there's a particular tenderness that stands out in the, in the Gospel of Luke. You probably know this about the Gospel of John. That even more than the tenderness, what stands out in the Gospel of John is His glory. We beheld His glory is the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. It is the portrayal of divinity that stands out in the Gospel of John. But what about Mark? Do you know about Mark? This is the Gospel where Jesus is portrayed as a servant. Surely the passage that we looked at earlier one of the reasons why. And so, why is this passage even in the Gospel of Mark? Certainly to support that portrayal of Jesus as the supreme servant of God, the supreme servant of humankind, and his self giving But it's also there to teach us how to be followers. It's also there, the Gospels are there to teach us how to become more like Him. And so I ask you the question then, how do you understand this call to become a servant? How do you personalize that? And don't just try and figure that out in five or ten seconds. Don't even try and figure that out in 20 minutes. Take that with you and talk to the Lord about it. Because there are specific ways in which He wants to shape us more like Christ. And what you want to know, what I want to know is, what is that? I do know this. But I've tried to make it my goal throughout life not to be one of those prima donna preachers. One of those guys that has to drive the biggest car or wear the fancy suit or whatever. Something about that, for whatever reason, just doesn't ring true to the call of Christ. And there's other issues that he wants to do. You see, I value my time. I value the ministry of preaching. If I'm not careful, I can think that that is a bigger deal than what you do representing Jesus Christ. What you do filled with the Holy Spirit from week to week. And if I get hung up on my importance or my position, I'm messing up. I'm getting in the way of what God would do in and through me. But you know, the reason it's spoken is not just to set preachers in line. It's all of us. It's the invitation to experience the freedom and the joy and the purpose and the fellowship of Jesus that comes when we care about others. It's not my strong point. I'm grateful for many in this church where the gift of mercy and the gift of service stands out. We did the spiritual gifts in the inventory a while back, and what I would tell you is that is a strong characteristic within the body of believers at Paley Baptist Church. There are people here, 
the death thrill out of God using them to bless somebody else. You ought to be thrilled about that. You're good to tell you as I read what Jesus said in this passage, it's plain that he is thrilled about that. So for me, what does it mean to become more like a servant? Well, I need to make it easier on our leaders to be leaders, for one thing. That's something the Lord showed me. You can talk to me about this where I haven't quite done what I should. And you don't talk to one another about it. I would prefer that you said, Pastor, I really could use some help in this way. Could you make yourself available? See, with a servant heart, I was further along than I was, I would probably notice. But I get so preoccupied with my preacher studies. I'm out of that. You know that. But more of my life needs to be given to training and supporting and thinking with you how you can accomplish what God is causing you to dream for His glory. Because when the Spirit of God is mighty working in you, you are going to be dreaming about how God can change things around you and how He can use you to do it. How you can bless others. One thing that I need to know to be a better servant is that you've got a demanding life. What we do here at church at times is we expect a lot from those of us who assume a position of leadership. That's why an nominating committee knows it's challenging every year when we ask for people to take on certain positions because people know, well, there's just a few of us, and this thing could steamroll me. Well, if I'm going to be a better servant, I need to know that you've got a life and you've got demands on you got family and all of that, and we need to know that about each other. It makes us less impatient when things don't happen at our pace. So what we see here are teachings from the Lord. When Jesus says these words that maybe sound familiar to us, understand that the will of God for you and me is being revealed. We are asking, what is the will of God? Well, among other things, He wants us to take the posture and the attitude of servants. It is easy for me to get preoccupied with the sermon preparation task. But I need to be more invested in your ministry success. That's what I've been thinking about. So I'm inviting you to think seriously about what does it mean for me to live this out. What does it mean for me to be a servant and for me to know that my job is to help others to know that I am there for them? It transfers to any ability that the church has to do deacon ministry. It, ch it, it changes a Sunday school class into a, a, a ministry, a group ministry Serving one another and serving others that you know who need help when we see our role is to be there for others. And isn't that the kind of church you want to belong to? Isn't that what you pray for? Isn't that what you'd like to help one another to get it right and do it well? Because Jesus said, this is who I am. <laughs> Even though he is the Son of God, even though he is King, and even though he is divine, he is God the Son and the Son of God, he makes himself a servant. A great thing to do today would be to turn over to Philippians chapter 2 and read there and study there, but I'm not going to take that time. I invite you there because, again, the church is being taught years later to put it into practice. To have the mind and the attitude that Christ himself showed when he laid down his glory, stepped down from his throne, and got involved 
where involvement was needed, even than what it cost him his life. Jesus loves to see the servant quality in us. Now, having said that, let me flip around and sort of take the other side. That doesn't mean that he wants you to scurry around nervously trying to satisfy everybody's whims. Man, I know preachers who live that way and it's a miserable kind of way to live. It's, it's not the ministry that is entrusted when you're all about satisfying what people want. But, that being said, we need to mentally still put ourselves at others' disposal and pay attention to what is needed. And watch out for one another. Amen? This is a capacity that our Lord and Savior wants to cultivate in us. Because He loves us. Because He values that fellowship of fellow servants. But Jesus says, guys, if you're going to be a leader, this is what I want to see in you. Well, you're not hung up on being a leader. Where you're hung up on the needs of others who have hurts, who have needs, and who have places to go with God. Well, that's the word in all by itself, isn't it? I guess James and John were sort of put back in line, but, but why not? I mean, figure it out. You read this gospel. James and John were two out of the three, they were a majority who went up into the mount with Jesus. And they had that choice experience of seeing His deity revealed. They stood out when they came down from the mountain. You know what was happening? All the other guys were working with this, this young boy who was writhing on the floor. The foam was coming out of his mouth and he was convulsing and he was demon-possessed. And his father was going angry. And all the disciples were trying to pray the right prayer and lay on their hands. And, and none of that was happening. And Jesus said, this kind doesn't come out by faith and prayer. So after that happens, what, what you find in this conversation among them, some have been in the mountain and some have been wrestling with a hard situation. And then they have this conversation about who's top dog. Who is the greatest among us? And Jesus picks up on it and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And nobody wants to say anything. So Jesus takes a little child, stands him up in the middle of him, and all of a sudden it's his child that's important. All of a sudden Jesus wants to say, man, step off your high horse and pay attention to me. I call this child, he comes. What I got in mind for you, I'm calling you, you come, become as a little child. And he says that the kingdom of heaven will be filled with people like that, who are like little children. Jesus wanted us to rethink what we value. So it isn't our position so much as valuing others. What God really wants to do to bring them to his kingdom. Bring them into his life. Bring them into fellowship. Bring them out of sin. That is why the church exists, I think. So that in some sense, we too are to be a servant. Not just to each other, but to a world who desperately needs to know who Christ is. So whatever else God's plans for Paoli Baptist Church, pray that I will better understand that. Pray that we will better understand that. Pray that we may be empowered of God to be a powerful sign of His grace and care to a world that barely cares. On the way here this morning, I, we were trying to get up off of uh, 30 bypass on 202 and Man, a great big semi-trailer, Steve Stephen, was right off on the road shoulder. He <coughs> might have come close to crashing. It wasn't his driving, really. <coughs> and he said, did you see that guy? And I said, yeah. He said, early on I came here and 
somebody jokingly said, welcome to the city of brotherly shop. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it that way? And I plead guilty, man, but I'm in traffic. I think that getting where I want to get is the most important. I hate to have to wait on somebody who's poking along. Do not create a drive. <laughs> you scare them out of, out of their wits, maybe making a pass and go, ha ha! <laughs> Serves the right, pal! Yeah, me too. Well, getting back to what Jesus was talking about, it's an easy recognized. James and John, they are sitting straight, and probably the other guys are sitting there saying, Yeah, yeah, you had it coming. And Jesus calls them over to him. And he has the rest of the conversation. Uh, you see, the scripture tells us that they resented James and John because they wanted a position of importance. Why? They wanted it too. It doesn't say that. But the thing is, they envied somebody else's influence. They envied somebody else's even ambition for position. And tell me occasionally, you don't live and work with that problem. That every now and then somebody is being blessed and somebody's exalted and somebody gets a little certificate of recognition and it drives you bananas because how come your name wasn't mentioned? This was a spirit among these holy apostles. And Jesus has to deal with it. And this is a spirit that gets in me and you sometimes and Jesus wants to deal with it. Have you ever worked for a company? A, a big company? Well, you know these exist where you have all these people in the big enterprise and they put out the great billboards and the great advertising and the slick commercials on TV so that you would think that they are the latest and the greatest that the world has ever seen. But inside the great big company, every single department is fighting one another. Amen. <laughs> Somebody's saying amen. amen. That means you deal with this. <laughs> Must be real. Preacher hit a nerve. All right. There is a time where even though you're supposed to be playing on the same team, the people who work upstairs absolutely despise the people who work downstairs and vice versa. Amen. It's like they do little things by way of their memos and by way of the calls that don't get delivered to trip each other up. Yes, something's wrong with the world and sin is real. So is pride, and so is self-promotion instead of working together with a team. If you have worked with a company like that, if you have been, if you're one of the walking wounded who's lived through that, maybe you can identify with this. If you ever wanted to just sit down and say, hey, everybody, supposed to be on the same team. If you fail, I fail. If you succeed, we succeed. Yeah. And when self-advancement, getting up the career ladder, is an employee's top ambition, he's no good. Won't work out. <laughs> now let's transfer that to where we live here with the stained glass and all. It's real easy for me to say, preaching is all that matters. Missions is all that matters. And somebody else is in the music ministry, so worship is all that matters. Okay. Or, oh, yeah! <laughs> children's ministry. Children's ministry. You love it. You get VBS as your favorite time of year. You do all this crazy stuff for weeks getting ready. You, you practically burn yourself out, man, and we do it up. Kind of fun. But for some people, that's what it's about. It's what's important. And, and we could say that about others. It's our prayer ministry or it's our evangelism ministry. It's ministering to hurt, hurting people. That's what matters. It, well, it all matters, doesn't it? Amen? Amen? It all matters. And we do it together. And we value one another's contribution 
Because we care that the church and you and I in our individual lives have a more faithful expression of who Jesus is. And Jesus is a servant. We're working together to lead people to a knowledge of the only one who can save. We're doing or should be doing whatever it takes to really do discipleship, to make more and better disciples. And our lives need to be invested the way that His was invested, what Jesus gave His life to, to bring about in people's lives the release, the productivity, the relationship with God. That's where we need to be invested. And what that says to me is, Draper, come back to where you belong. When I get it right, being a servant, I'll see the need and do something about it as soon as I see it. I won't call you out by name, but we got people here who do that. They're not waiting for the memo. They're not waiting for me to phone call them and say, hey, we got this or that issue. They see the need. They do it. And nobody will ever know that they're the ones that did it. Because it's not about that. It's, it's just about their church being the way the Lord wants it. You know what God did for us? He saw what was needed and did something about it. He gave himself a ransom. He gave himself. He called it a ransom because of what he did on the cross was such a great cause. It was the only way to get us off and out from sin's power. It was what was required in order that God might reclaim us. And today we're supposed to be remembering that. It was what was done today to free us from sin so we don't want to live in sin anymore. But even before the cross, when he paid that ransom, every day, Jesus was spending himself on others. He was constantly giving himself to the goal of getting others ready for the kingdom of God. And he was available when the demands of doing ministry were so tremendous. He couldn't even find rest. He caught it on a boat ride. He would do it and he and his disciples would get away and still the crowds would come. You've heard the stories in the Gospel of Mark. Ministry was demanding and he was spending himself because of the need. You know what? I think Jesus' work was perfect. Come on, you're back. What do you say when I say that? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Jesus' work was perfect. And he was criticized. <coughs> and even <coughs> when you and I were the ones who were guilty of taking him for granted, he still pays attention to our need and he still pays attention to our souls. He did all this even before Calvary, and He's doing it today after He's risen on His throne. He still cares for us. He still attends to us when we take Him for granted. And the only reason that all of my selfishness and all of yours can be pardoned is because of the purchase He made through His precious blood. And so He speaks this Wonderful opportunity and challenge to him. Stand shoulder to shoulder with me and be a servant, he says. Invested like I was invested. The task that he had was to implant purpose and principles and the vision of the kingdom of God in people's lives. So that the life of the kingdom of God might become your life and mine. So that the message of the kingdom of God might be your message and mine. And so that the ministry of the kingdom of God might be our ministry too. And so the hope of the kingdom of God would be your hope and mine. The sons of Zebedee had this agenda status. Even though they saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, What was it? Was it not clear to him that Jesus had a status set apart? And yet they wanted to be right next to him in his kingdom. 
I think it's okay to be close to Jesus, but not if it's all about prestige and power and people noticing who you are. So he does not promise them all that they wish for just because they're devoted to him. And he does not promise us all that we ask for just because we sign on with him. It isn't about our status. It was Christ himself who had the status set apart. On that holy mountain where the radiance of his divine glory was seeping through his pores, and his face became like lightning, and even his robes reflected the purity of his priesthood and the holiness of the Lord. Jesus, it was clear, had a status set apart. And soon I believe that the whole world is going to see Christ coming in majesty and in might. And on that day, in an instant, if your God's tr truly his child, it will be manifest who you are because you too will be transformed in his resurrection glory and likeness. John says, Beloved, behold what manner God has bestowed upon us that we should be the children of God. And it doesn't even appear what we shall be. But we know that when we see Him, we will be like Him because we're going to see Him as He is. And then He says, everybody who has His hope gets ready and purifies Himself because He is pure. So a day is coming when you will have a status set apart. You will be partakers of that glory. But in the meantime, like Peter and John, who yearn to go further, who yearn for that recognition, you know what? you want others to see your closeness and your relationship with Christ, then let Him by His Spirit do that transforming work in you. You see, when James and John drew some of the Lord and understood how to apply what Jesus was saying, they became servants. Their own transformation had become. <coughs> the world could see something of Jesus visibly upon their lives. And that's what he wants to do with us. Just before I got up here to preach, the song came to me that I think we're supposed to sing right now. I don't think we have the words, guys, and that's okay. It's just an old Gaither trio again called I Will Serve Thee Because I Love Thee. And I don't think we're going to have any accompaniment, Mr. Francis, that's all right. But I'd like to try and sing it, and if you want to sing it with me, then I invite you to do so. I'll just sing what I know of and sing it again. I invite you to sing along. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. I was lost before you found me. You have given life to me. Pardoning broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your Peace. 